Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. And welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church here in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests here in person and virtually. My name is James Coombs, and it is my honor to serve as a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielina Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect to the rights and wisdom of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories and commit to decolonizing our own practices and ways of being with each other in good, relation, in good relationship with the indigenous people of this land and with the land itself. Today's service is led by our interim minister, the Reverend Dr. Teresa Cooley, with music, uh, music director, Dr. Zaneda Robles, associate director of music and accompanist extraordinaire, Wells Lang, <laughs> and, our <fan> <laughs> and our fantastic choir and bell choir. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. And thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed and recorded on YouTube. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary, in the narthex, or in our family lounge in the living room of Neighborhood House where the service is live screen, streamed on a big screen. And there are some important announcements that we would like to make sure you are aware of today. First, welcome home to our Esperanza International volunteers who by all accounts, who by all accounts had a very successful weekend pouring the foundation and initiating the walls of a home for our partners in Tijuana. Please join us after this service for our annual meeting where we will celebrate the year, make some important decisions as a community, and prepare to launch into the new church year. Following the annual meeting, we are holding a potluck and volunteer appreciation luncheon, and as a special surprise, we will hopefully witness live and on screen the graduation of our ministerial intern, Angelina Jackson, from Meadville Lombard Seminary right here. And you are welcome to bring your plate back into the sanctuary when we do that. Today marks the beginning of our summer schedule where we will be holding one service at 10 a.m. each Sunday. Additionally, the newsletter will move to, from weekly to monthly for June and July and August, and the, and the two-service set schedule will begin again on Sunday, September 10th. And this Thursday, at 7 p.m., the Building Bridges Tax Force will be holding a presentation on cultural humility. And next Sunday at 11, the Seventh Principal Committee is hosting a film screening and potluck discussion featuring the short film Current Revolution. Our order of service and more extensive announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email posted in the narthex or through the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many more activities at the welcome table. And again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service. And I have a special announcement from Jennifer. My apologies for that, Jennifer. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Van Heining, and I've taught youth spiritual education classes here at Neighborhood for many years. It's YSE, teacher recruitment time again, and I'm here to tell you that we need your help. I'm going to tell you a story and use an analogy for how fulfilling volunteering through church can be. Last weekend, my son, Rohin, who's 16, um, and I helped, build, helped a Mexican family building a house in the outskirts of Tijuana. We did this through the Esperanza program our church supports. It was the best Mother's Day ever <laughs> in 16 years. Now we're back and it's time to help build our spiritual home at Neighborhood. The trip to Tijuana include, included me bringing and then forgetting our passports. <laughs> Trace is a longtime Esperanza organizer in our ride to Mexico, along with his wife, our church board president, Elizabeth Sadlon, were so kind and patient, helping me solve our passport problem. I was so embarrassed that I wanted to give up and take the train home, letting Trace proceed alone to join the rest of the group in Tijuana. Elizabeth gently and firmly told me, 
they need you. And it went straight to my heart. I got over my feelings and stayed with the plan, and I'm sure glad I did. What a great first trip to Mexico it was for Rohin and me. I'm telling you now that we really need you. What feelings do you have that prevent you from saying yes to teaching YSE? What could you do to get over yourself and join us in this important work of building our, the foundation of our faith? Young UUs really need you, kind, responsible, knowledgeable adults that you are. The work of hand pouring concrete for the foundation of that Mexican family's house would have continued without me and my very energetic teenage son, but without the two of us, the work would have been more for those who, who had shown up. Like all work, the work of teaching YSE is easier when done together. We need more teachers. The teachers like me who do volunteer really appreciate fresh co-teachers, of course. The kids also appreciate the fresh perspectives that you would bring. Just like Esperanza volunteers build homes and families for families who need them, neighborhood has become a home for all of us. Volunteers work hard to do upkeep on our church. Some play bell choir. Um, why do you come to church? Some of you started coming because you had children who you wanted to raise in a spiritual community that matched your values. New families are coming to us. More young families will be attracted, by, attracted to neighborhood by our new minister, Reverend Omega Burkhart, who was at the border last Friday, handing out supplies to asylum seekers, waiting between the border walls to get into the US. These are tough times, and all of us need a strong spiritual home that's ready to nurture us and to welcome new members. Maybe you come because you want to be together with people you respect, people who inspire you, like Trace Izzard and Elizabeth Sadlon and other volunteers at Esperanza and at church who inspire me and who have for many years. Maybe you haven't made a trip with Esperanza yet, but you yearn for an adventure now, one closer to home. Well, adventure awaits you right here in our YSE classrooms. <laughs> when Matt Vasco, reads the story for all ages during the late service on Sundays, there's often this or that lively voice that pipes up making comments that have everyone in the sanctuary laughing and asking, who's that? I've heard that question from congregants more than once. Well, come volunteer as a teacher and you'll find out whose voice that is. It could belong to any of the bright young people who participate in YSE. Yes, planning an engaging lesson is sometimes challenging, but once I get to the classroom, I feel energized to be with these kids. They say it like it is. They give you what they've got, and I come away feeling that I've lived my values by spending time with them. At Esperanza, everyone volunteers, everyone signs up for volunteer jobs at the Posada, the place we stay, in addition to our volunteer jobs pouring concrete and passing cinder blocks. My son and I were washing dishes Saturday afternoon when others were out on the patio um, having a happy hour in conversation after a day of hard work. Barbara Peters Meyer, a frequent Esperanza volunteer, my, my son said, she's cool, um, came into the kitchen to get something and commented, I wish you could join us instead of doing dishes. Of course, doing dishes is not our favorite activity, but Rohan and I worked together efficiently and I got it done, and we got it done. Someone washed our dishes after dinner that night, someone else washed our dishes the next morning after breakfast. As a team, working together, doing our individual jobs, we made the trip a success. It was a pleasure to do our jobs and to enjoy how others did theirs. And by the end of the trip, a strong foundation for a new house was built. As we sing our children out, we sing, we help each other learn and search for what is true. We also sing, work toward a peaceful world and the web of life's the way. The web of chores is also the way. <laughs> Rohan and I and the rest of the Esperanza volunteers were working just as our values call us to do. And it was a great time. I'm so glad we made that journey. Come, 
we need you. Please make a YSE teaching journey with us. You'll, you'll surely be glad that you did. Sign up outside at the YSE table after the service. Or speak to Matt Vasco. There's a lot going on this Sunday. Democracy at work. Thank you. quick announcement about a quick word about bells today. Um, we are down our intrepid bell choir director, Thomas Simpson. He's, ha he hasn't, he's battling an illness right now, so keep him in your thoughts. He's going to be okay, but he needs to rest and not spread germs. And he was like, I, can, I think I can do it. I'm like, no, don't come. <laughs> um, so he's, he's with us in our heart, and we're so happy that we have Lisa Sindstrom, who's uh, subbing in today a guest bell ringer thank you lisa so much for being here and now and we also have wells joining us on piano today and we have ellen playing the flute this is an extravaganza of a piece we're so excited to offer to you brother james air
Wonderful. This chalice lighting was originally shared at the ordination of Reverend Omega Burkhart by her children, modified for our special congregation meeting in April, and shared again here today. From the heights of the Sierra Madres to the depths of the Santa Monica Bay, from the open lands of the high desert to the lush forest in our own backyard, this is the place and space we call home. From the origins of the collective history of this congregation in 1885, and from a time that stretches beyond the generational awareness of our histories, we are called. We have inherited the labor of our ancestors, both known and unknown, through lineage and by adoption, and we are called to continue their work. The wide and vast voices from our community of communities calls us now. Collectively, we hold each other's joys, and each other's sorrows and we leave our own stories into the we leave our own stories into the stories of our ancestors today we are making a call and responding to a call that comes from our history our bodies and our minds as they exist in the present and from the echoes of future generations in the weaving of our stories which make up this web of life we must remember to not cut the strings for there are others coming after us others with tender hearts and strong wills, with creativity and determination, and for those who will live in this house of tomorrow, we light this chalice to honor our ancestors, to honor our bodies in the here and now, and to light the way for those who will come after us. and singing our opening hymn number 124, Be That Guide. Ooh. 
morning. Good morning. I'm Matt Vasco, Neighborhood's Director of Spiritual Exploration, and I have a story for all ages. So because we've got our wonderful bell set up here, I'm going to ask the kids to please just stay in your seats with your parents or grandparents, and I'll just tell the story from here. So today's service focuses on democracy and the democratic process, the upsides and downsides of that process. And so I thought I would share a personal story about my first memory of participating in the democratic process. I was in the third grade at St. Mary's Catholic Elementary School in Assumption, Ohio. Don't get more Catholic than that. <laughs> and uh, I had a wonderful teacher, Ms. Zajac, who I just adored. And Ms. Zajac, uh, for our uh, Halloween party that year, said that we were going to get to vote on what we were going to have to drink, because she had this wild idea for a drink, and she didn't know if we were going to like it or not, so she was going to let us vote on it. So our choices were between uh, what in Northwest Ohio we called pop, um, which I believe is called soda here in Southern California. <laughs> and I actually have lived here longer now than I've ever lived there, so it sounds weird to say pop now. Um, but uh, it was between pop and this special concoction she was interested in making for us called Witch's Brew, which she explained to us was a mix of rainbow sherbet and Sprite. So I did not like rainbow sherbet. And I didn't like any kind of sherbet. It was just like a little tangy. I didn't really care for it. So I remember being very set on knowing how I was going to vote. So we did a, a show of hands vote like we're going to use in our meeting today. And she said, uh, uh, who would like witch's brew? And I saw lots of hands go up. And I, of course, had my mind firmly made up. So she said, who would like pop? And I, my hand shot in the air. And I was the only one. <laughs> I was the only one. Everybody else voted for Witch's Brew except for me. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so the day came, and Ms. Zajac came all dressed in her witch's outfit. And she was totally in character. She was having tons of fun with it. You know, she's like cackling while she's making the Witch's Brew. And she, uh, she put like a whole gallon of sherbet in there and then, you know, like poured in the Sprite. I thought about like asking maybe if I could just get like a cup of Sprite <laughs> while she was like pouring it all in there. But I thought, no, no, you know, we, I, I had my chance, I had my vote and clearly I lost. So I'm gonna have witch's brew. So I learned two things about democracy from that experience. The first is, just because you have a voice doesn't necessarily mean that things go your way, all right? So, like, there's that side of democracy, right? And the other is, to my surprise, the witch's brew was pretty good. <laughs> and I've always liked Sherbert a little better since then. So even if you don't get your way, it can still turn out okay in the end anyway. So just a little inside advice from third grade Matt, everything's gonna be okay. Don't worry about it. Thank you. And we have a fun all ages youth activity planned this morning. For all our children and youth, um, we're going to be making a craft right behind Neighborhood House on the picnic tables. So why don't we sing our children and youth out to their activity?
Giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation designates a dedicates 100% of its contributions to a local social justice organization or activity. In addition to the plate, online giving is available using the QR code on the donations box just outside in the sanctuary or using the text instructions shown on the screen right now. If you wish to make a payment towards your pledge or contribute to church operations, make a note on the subject line or use an envelope available at the donations box. And this, week's, this week our gifts go to Diverse and Revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries, or DRUM. Here to tell us more is Neighborhood People of Color co-chair, Gail Shand. Gail? Good morning, neighborhood. I am Gail Shand, a co-facilitator, co-chair of Neighborhood People of Color, along with Julian Juarez, who isn't here today. So DRUM, DRUM stands for a Diverse and Revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries. Its origin started over 30 years ago with a professional group for African American UU ministers, expanded to all UU ministers of color, and in 1997, open to all black, indigenous, and other people of color, lay, or professional within Unitarian Universalism. Members of Neighborhood Church have been actively involved with DRUM as event participants, organizers, and board members, and Neighborhood People of Color is considered the oldest chapter of DRUM. Like many of the fellowships and small group ministries we have here at Neighborhood Church, DRUM has served to bring together black, indigenous, and other people of color in meaningful and critical mass ways, and has encouraged the development of groups like Allies for Racial Equity to partner to address issues of systemic inequality and to transform Unitarian Universalism. DRUM help makes it possible for black, indigenous, and other people of color to fully experience what Unitarian Universalism has to offer and to be present and active across our member congregations. Your contributions to DRUM help support ministry and chaplaincy to people of color across the denomination, support regional and national gatherings, assist youth of color to attend denominational and regional events, have supported families of color and multiracial families in connecting with each other, and support events like the recent community-wide public worship service held on May 11th, featuring Reverend Katie Romano Griffin, last year's uh, public wide service, which also featured Dr. Zanita Robles and Wells Lang. And there's an upcoming spring caucus, and now there are new monthly BIPOC-led services. Uh, registration is available on our website, drub.org, and for everyone, this is there are so many events that are open wide to all members of UU and the events that are specifically for BIPOC and we encourage everyone to take part in everything that we have. Thank you so much for giving. Will today's volunteers please bring the plates forward and thank you for giving generously.
says annual meeting Sundays aren't fun. <laughs> Please join me in a spirit of prayer, of meditation, reflection, as I share these words from the poet Marge Piercy. What can they do to you? Whatever they want. They can set you up, they can bust you, they can break your fingers, they can burn your brain with electricity, blur you with drugs till you can't walk, can't remember. They can do anything, you can't stop them. How can you stop them? Alone, you can fight, you can refuse, you can take what revenge you can, but they roll over you. But two people fighting back to back can cut through a mob Snake dancing file can break a cordon. An army can meet an army. Two people can keep each other sane, can give support, conviction, love, massage, hope. Three people are a delegation, a committee, a wedge. With four, you can play bridge <laughs> and start an organization. With six, you can rent a whole house, eat pie for dinner with no seconds, and hold a fundraising party. A dozen make a demonstration, a hundred fill a hall, a thousand have solidarity and have their own newsletter. <laughs> 10,000 power and your own paper. A hundred thousand, your own media. 10 million, your own country. It goes on one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again and they said no. It starts when you say we and know who you mean. And each day you mean one more. Amen.
When I was in divinity school about 100 years ago, <laughs> I had the privilege of learning Unitarian history from the venerable historian Conrad Wright. James, did you get to learn from Conrad Wright? My colleague James Ford is with us. Conrad was a very slight and soft-spoken man, but I don't think there was a single person who would ever dare argue with him. He was also rather old-fashioned as a teacher. The first requirement in his class was that we each memorize the definition of the Congregational Church as contained in the Cambridge Platform of 1648. We all had to stand in turn and present this from memory. A Congregational Church is by the institution of Christ a part of the militant visible church consisting of a company of saints by calling, united into one body by a holy covenant for the public worship of God and the mutual education of one another in the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. That sounds like us, right? <laughs> There's probably not one phrase in that description that you would recognize as describing a contemporary Unitarian Universalist church. Don't even ask me what militant visible means. And I dare say we're not a company of saints. <laughs> if you'll pardon my saying so. Which is a good thing. So why did he inflict this particular torture on us? Because it was the foundational document of the congregational movement begun in the early centuries of this country's founding. Those religious people who came over from England to steal land away from Native Americans mostly left England to get away from the hierarchical structure of the Anglican church, a structure they considered hypocritical, and corrupt, and in fact, non-biblical. There were no such things as bishops and popes in the Bible. This movement grew parallel with the earliest understandings of a political democracy in our country, each movement influencing the other. Both were about self-determination and the rejection of outside or autocratic authority each of these systems began, of course, with recognizing only the power and rights of white men with property. But over time, that began to shift legally, if not culturally, to include such concepts as all men are created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights in our political structures. And within our congregational systems, we evolved to affirm and promote our fifth principle the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within both within our congregations and in society as a whole. These are all fine words, and I think in concept I certainly still endorse them, but in practice they've been less than exemplary. I've talked before about my early life as a political activist working in the Texas electoral system and government offices. I went into this work as a wide-eyed innocent and came out of it cynical and frustrated. One story I love to tell, I may have told you all this before, but it's always worth retelling, involved three state senators, Babe Schwartz, who was my state senator, Oscar Mozzie, and John Rogers. Babe and Oscar were what they called yellow dog Democrats, fighting against the right-wing Republican structure that was exemplified by John Rogers. They were constantly entangled in one kind of fight or another until one day on the Senate floor, John dropped dead of a heart attack. A state funeral was held and the senators lined up to pay their respects Babe was right behind Oscar, and when Oscar got up to the casket, the open casket, Oscar reached out and almost reverently touched John's face. And Babe whispered to him, what in the world are you doing? And Oscar whispered back, 
I just want to make sure the son of a bunch is dead. <laughs> Not exactly a noble or high-minded sentiment. As disgusted as I became with the doggy dog world of politics, I was also developing a fear about what was happening within me, spiritually. I began to see how I was starting to see the world in terms of winners and losers, the derisive way in which I viewed those outside of the process who I thought didn't understand and who I believed were too ignorant to care. I was learning to compromise on things that were of ultimate value to me. And I began to lose sight of why I was doing that work. This is when I turned to ministry, thinking I would rather work on changing hearts and minds than laws or political structures. The fact that our movement was based on democratic principles made it familiar to me, and I valued then and I value now our emphasis on individual conscience and the responsibility for developing our own religious understandings. But just as our democratic political systems are far from perfect, I think sometimes the way in which we have come to understand the democratic process in our congregations can suffer from the same issues. My colleague, Parisa Parsa, wrote an excellent chapter about the fifth principle in a book which examines each of our principles, and I think she is worth quoting at some length. She said, in our religious lives, the democratic process requires trust in the development of each individual conscience. A belief that such development is possible for each of us, as well as a commitment to cultivate our own conscience. We would call it a commitment to the value of each person. In the words of Theodore Parker, democracy means not I am as good as you are, but you are as good as I am. She continues, my connection with the sacred is only as, as important as my willingness to acknowledge the same connection in others. It's the right of conscience, not the right of ego, that we preserve in our fifth principle. Everyone who has lived with other people knows that we can commit to a community and then find ourselves at odds with the community's decisions. The ego is tempted to rail against the community and even to stomp away in anger. Ego freedom lets us walk away in a huff. But freedom of conscience, having already committed to a life of accountability to the community, demands fidelity even in disagreement. A community to whom we've connected ourselves must be offered the same respect we demand from the community. The opportunity to hear our objection, our fear, or our pain, and to respond to it according to the dictates of communal bonds. In a healthy community, each of us should occasionally be in the minority. The experience promotes spiritual growth and a deepened understanding of the cost and the rewards of community. Such important words. As Matt said so eloquently and profoundly, all people have a say does not mean all people get their way. Not getting our way may be frustrating from time to time, but getting our way all the time sets us up as petty despots asserting our individual rights as more important than the health of the community as a whole. Several decades ago, Mohandas K. Gandhi warned against what he called the seven social sins. He named them as politics without principle, wealth without work, commerce without morality, pleasure without conscience, education without character, science without humanity, and worship without sacrifice. 
The same cautions should be attended to within our religious communities. Are our individual rights always to trump the best interests of the community? As R Richard Reitman Fox put it, we should find a way to come to a clear understanding that communal and individual fulfillment rise or fall together. There is not a private virtue that does not presuppose a public virtue and vice versa. Our religious understandings may have evolved within the context of honoring individual expression, but they have also been beset by some of the same sins of some of our external structures, a dangerous kind of idolatry of individualism, a belief that I have the right to believe or say whatever I think, even if it causes harm or is hurtful. There's a growing movement within Unitarian Universalism right now that calls itself the fifth principle community, which sees itself as standing against what they see as political correctness and angrily asserts the right to say or do whatever they want, no matter the consequences. Okay, I will try to pull myself down from my high horse at this moment and try to make it applicable to what we've been doing and learning together here at Neighborhood. As we've been confronting difficult truths from the past, the eugenics philosophy of our forebears or even the misconduct of a previous minister, we have done so in a way that tries to uphold a collective vision. Not necessarily the assumption that everyone will think alike or will always agree, but affirming the importance of exploring these wounds together with an eye toward what kind of community you want to be and become. I love that Elizabeth has introduced to us a methodology of voting on things that allows for gradations of opinion rather than the polarity of yes or no. This allows us to actually learn from one another what is on our minds rather than arguing back and forth from positions. When I look back about at what I've been preaching about in the last three years, I see a kind of constant theme that being a covenanted community means trying to constantly find a balance between me and we. In today's polarized world, we don't need a parallel polarization in here. Instead, we get to practice what it means to learn and grow together, not in certainty, but in curiosity. The theologian Cornell West put it well when he said, a rich life is fundamentally a life of serving others, a life of trying to leave the world a little better than you found it, that rich life comes into being in human relationships this is true at the personal level. Those of you who've been in love know what I'm talking about, he says. It's also true at the organizational and communal level. It's difficult to find joy by yourself, even if you have all the right toys. Just ask somebody who's got a lot of material possessions but doesn't have anyone to share them with. He says, now that's at the personal level. There is a political version of this. It has to do with what you see when you get up in the morning and look in the mirror and ask yourself whether you're simply wasting your time on this planet or spending time in an enriching way. We're talking fundamentally about the meaning of life and the place of struggle. This, I believe, is what we came here to do, to struggle together to learn how we can live lives that bring benefit not just to ourselves, but to others. I have been so impressed with how you have been learning to do this together. It's a learning that will never be complete, but instead sets us upon a journey of exploration that can serve everyone well and infinitely expand the health of this community. As Marge Piercy said in her poem that I shared as a prayer, it goes on one at a time. 
It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again and they say no. It starts when you say we and know who you mean and each day you mean one more. May this community always engage in this learning together. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 1064 in your teal hymnals are on the screen above. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing 1064 Blue Boat Home. <laughs> Our benediction from Gwendolyn Brooks in appreciation of Paul Robeson. We are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. See you at the annual meeting in about half an hour, and we will gather back here for those on um, YouTube, link in with Zoom, and look forward to celebrating democracy together.